Kia ora and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby Pod. I'm Ross Carl, back with the boys after a couple of weeks off. James Parsons in studio with me. Bryn Hall, of course, down in... We're in Christchurch at the moment, Bryn, is that where you are? Yeah, I'm in Christchurch, mate. Yep, Just back from Queenstown, or...? <laughs> yeah, came out from Queenstown. Oh, yeah. didn't, get on, didn't get out on the golf course, unfortunately. Um, but no, I met up with um, a couple of old Harbour greats, um, Mufi Taramai, so great to catch up with them and spend a bit of time with them. Oh, nice, nice, but not on the golf course. Not on the golf course. Not on the golf course. Slow Sunday start, I heard. Unless yeah. it's tea time. Uh, yeah, yeah. After all of the practice he had <laughs> the week before, it's a surprise. Yeah. It was an absolute pro by that point. Surely. Hey, how, speaking of pros, how good, Foxy. Second at the Irish Open. Mm. I know we're not yeah. a golf podcast. But. No, no, but geez, he's been good this year. He has, very good. He's been very, very good this year. But we do have some good stuff to talk about because, wow, the All Blacks were good. Uh, there were some crazy results. Australia, England and South Africa, Wales going down right to the wire. It was a hell of a weekend of international rugby. Let's start, as we always try to, but don't always succeed, <laughs> with the quick fire round. <laughs> Jibba, your team of the week. Who was it this week? Fiji. Man, they, they, I think they could be a dark horse for 2023. Like the, Their physicality... Their ability to win their own ball, get across the gain line in their offload game as expected. But the way they're winning collisions is allowing them to keep that ball alive. Um, oh, it, was, it, was, it was a great watch. And a Thailand team that probably came with a lot of expectation, mm. um, they did the business. And it's not just the tries, to be fair. They held them out to zero and there was a lot of attacking prowess there. So. That wasn't very quick fire, sorry. <laughs> I felt for those Tongan players because they were hot and Tongan players hadn't had a lot of time together before that. But uh, what about for you, Bryn? Yeah, I had the Fijians as well. Look, I thought their, uh, their offload ability and physicality, um, it was actually pretty similar scenes to watching the Chiefs and the Fijian Drua, which are those offload, offloads and how hard they are to beat at home. So I've gone Fiji, but then I think you can't go past the All Blacks. You know, they had a lot of pressure on them. And, you know, we talked about how good this Irish team was and look, they put through a, a pretty clinical performance and things that they'll be pretty happy around. And we'll, no doubt we'll delve into that a little bit more, but, um, you know, you can't go past the All Blacks and their dominant performance against Ireland on the weekend. I oh, will delve into that. We'll yeah. be here for another hour. So he, did you go Fiji or the All Blacks there? You confused yeah. me. Well, you went Fiji. Yeah. And I, I've stuff on the back of that, but then I'm going for the All Blacks. Okay. I'm going for the All Blacks. So he's got two teams. Yeah, it's like choosing between Crusaders <laughs> loose forwards each week. Yeah. He has to choose his team of the week. <laughs> um, what about Test Player of the Week for you? Artie. Yeah. Man, wow. That's all I've got. Yeah. Just some performance. Yeah, three letters. All the analysis you need. Oh, <laughs> wasn't it though? Like, yeah. holy dooly. That was a hell of a shift at Test Match, you know, level. Um, the speed of that game, and he's still, you know, going right to the end. Um, and the amount of touches, the amount of involvements, second to none. Great player. Great, Great. player. For you, Bryn? Yeah, I would have gone Artie, but I think it's going to go someone a bit different. I thought Aaron Smith um, was great. And I think what he kind of gave us, what we talked about previously around um, with the quick tempo and the ability that Nuggie has to do that for us, gives guys like Artie or the ability to be able to play on top of teams and being able to make our boys go forward and have um, a lot of opportunities. So look, I thought Aaron was at his, at his world-class best and probably needed, I think, for us. We talked about it a lot, so I think Aaron Smith. But Artie, you could go with Artie as well. He's um, He's been some phenomenal form. Now, you gave us your test team of the week, Bryn. What about the team that's improved the most since November and what we saw at the end of last year? Um, well, I just think the Fijians, I think, um, for me personally. Um, I think, you know, the involvement of the, the, the Fijian Dural players have been able to play at that Super Rugby Pacific level and then have been able to come back and get in the performance of how they're playing. And I think, you know, don't underestimate, um, you know, Mark Ryan, Jason Ryan and his involvement in that group as well. Um, you know, very early on in their set piece trip, you could probably see a little bit more about this, but, you know, the transition, get into that transition zone and then playing on top of teams with the physicality from that, um, set up some pretty early points for them. So, um, look, I know how it's great for the Pacific uh, Nations and that kind of competition, knowing that it's going to be in the kind of Fiji and weather, but um, look, I think they're a dark horse. They can continue to keep working on that set piece and getting that game management right because if you see the scenes on the weekend with them being able to offload the ball, play on top of teams, um, you know, the All Blacks felt that last year when we played them in, in, in Forsyth Bar and Dunedin, how, um, how hard it is to stop. So, um, yeah, I'd definitely go Fiji for sure. Sort of uh, just before I give my team, and I know this is quick fire, so I apologise. Um, <laughs> it's gone already. Yeah, it's gone. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sweet. No, yeah, no, it's getting ha shot down. Happy days. Weeks these days. <laughs> happy days. Um, 
It's sort of like, I want to liken it to when the Jaguares went really well and then the Argentina went really well. Like, I feel like the Indrua boys, and because they've played a lot together, mm. you know, they almost hit the ground running in different jerseys, but, um, you know, similar playing style, styles. So um, I, I think that's quite a key point leading in, and not an excuse for the Tongan team, but they were coming from all different parts of the world, haven't had a lot of time together, so I think they'll only get better as well, um, but yeah, the Fijians were, I went with the All Blacks, I think they've improved the most, I think there's some key changes that they made, they, they went between hitting the middle forward or the third forward um, a little bit wider, and, and that really nullified um, that line speed pressure because they managed to, if you use Artie's try is probably the best example, is managed to get on the outside um, and, and bust through. But there was also, um, before Geordie Barrett's try, they hit Whitelock and he goes out the back and it enables them to get around that line speed pressure. And, and a lot of the time, Bodie didn't even, um, uh, Bowden Barrett didn't even, <laughs> sorry, nicknames, um, <laughs> Bowden Barrett didn't even take steps. He almost just caught, stayed flat footed, sucked them out and then picked off the right option. So, and then there was obviously the Quinn um, Tapia try, which is again, noticing that there's so many bodies in the front line, put it in behind. And then Aaron Smith picking through the middle of the ruck is another way to beat line speed pressure because they're spread across the field, not necessarily in and around that ruck. So he took it. So there were two or three tries mm. that was, you know, we hear about the All Blacks not being able to deal with line speed pressure. I, I just thought they were exceptional. They didn't have a lot of ball they had to defend their hearts out and probably that was the best face of the game. But I think when they had that ball in attack, they showed massive growth in their structures and their play. Mm. What about the breakdown and collisions? That was the other area that was talked about last week, yes. about a place that they really needed to clean up, Bryn. Did they clean it up sufficiently? I think they did. And I guess the variety that, that Jip's talking about, I thought that was a, a big part of it. Um, you know, Traditionally, a lot of the teams, you've got the ball carrying in the middle and the two, you've got one on the outside and one on the inside. But... I guess what that does, it just moves that point of contact just a little bit further. So, you know, Irish teams and Northern Hemisphere teams are quite dominant when you're kind of that rock action, you know, the first two or three players next to the ruck. And I guess with Aaron Smith's pass and his width on his pass, being able to get outside that, it gives you an opportunity. Maybe it might be on a back or, you know, what, not one of a, a bigger forwards. And so, but then from that, the efficiency of the two guys coming from that inside have to be really efficient to clean because sometimes... The guy on the outside can actually be isolated because he's not the, the tip guy isn't on his outside. But the ability of, you know, I look at Scott Barrett for a couple of examples, him being able to get over the advantage line and fall in the way of where that ball is needed. And then Aaron Smith was there to get it there straight away. So I think it was a great variety that they used. And I think even moving forward from that, they could actually get a bit more variety around that outside the third guy, getting a hard line, running a tip line even more, one, one more over to be able to cause more um, headaches for that defense. But um, we talked around the physicality was the most important part for the All Blacks. And I thought, you know, physicality-wise, even though they didn't have much ball, the times that they did have the ball, they were able to build pressure and then been able to score points off that. So, um, yeah, a massive tick in that physicality. And no doubt, they will go to Forsyth Bar with a lot more confidence knowing that they can do it against this Irish team. Yeah, I think they were direct in their nature and it allowed Nuggy to be the very best. You know, Bryn made him his player of the week, but a lot of that, and I know I'm going to sound like a classic forward, but it's off the back of that clean, Chris ruck ball. And Bryn's right in terms when they hit that third defender. If you're the middle guy, Ireland were like rushing up and it's almost like a triangle on you and it enabled them to get that easy gain line because this defender's sitting a little bit back and if they fall the right way, all those cleaners are coming from the inside. So they just get rid of those bodies, the ball's there and it's play. So the, the, those adjustments were critical in having that success. It wasn't, um, you know, it was really calculated is probably what I'm trying to Their phys physical dominance and their ability of getting it was really calculated. It wasn't just, you know, one-off runners trying to win that macho wall. It was, it was you know, well thought out and, and executed to perfection. Was it an obvious adjustment? You know, was it an adjustment that Ireland would have expected but just couldn't handle? Oh, I think you'd have to prep for it, Bryn. I, I know they'll be better for it this week. Like, they know it now, so it's, it's what um, evolution is there in it, or th it comes back to who the decision maker of the passer, who he picks off, and, and those guys getting set early and providing that. But they'll be better for it. Like The score was a bit of a blowout. There was 10 minutes where they, they took off, but inside it, um, and around that, Ireland had a lot of ball and they were held up a few times. Um, you know, This is not a dead duck series and a guaranteed win in Dunedin, and they will make the adjustments. Not always easy in a game when it's, you know, I think they have done a little bit before Bryn, but like it was the most I'd seen it, and and and, and the execution of it, 
um, as I say, like Bodhi just holding his feet, and then Aaron, we know how good his pass is, but um, yeah, it was, they didn't have a lot of ball either, I suppose, as well. Do you know what I mean? So they didn't have a lot of opportunity to adjust because they had the majority of the possession. You, do you kind of want it that way in a way? If, if you don't have a lot of ball, in a way, what, everything you do is a threat. If you've got a lot of ball, suddenly they, they feel your pattern, Bryn. Yeah, I think so. But I think, you know, I look at kind of, if I use our experience at the, the Crusaders, sometimes we don't win games, we don't have a lot of ball. Sometimes you feel that you can actually win the game, you feel better without the ball. Especially if you're, you know, rocking it, you know, 90, 92% defensively. Um, more times or not, you're actually going to get penalties from whether it be a turnover, a counter ruck, or being able to put the team under pressure. Look, you look at Severis's try. You know, Ireland were just continually answering, asking questions of the All Blacks in that, but just due to the fact how um, how good the defence was, Sevi then scores that try just off a little fumble, an offload. James Lowe falls over, and then Sevi goes to full length of the try, which almost feels like a 14 point try because Ireland would have felt that they were in control, but I guess, I guess one thing that the All Blacks can can take confidence of in knowing is that the kind of changes that they did. You look at Bowden Barrett's try, um, try for Quinta Pye. You know, Jamison Gibson Parker, very similar to actually the, the Kiwis as well with Aaron Smith. That kind of space in behind just the ruck because the nines tend to slip and will be close to that ruck. That's one where you can nullify on line speed as well. So no doubt, you know, hitting that that third player again a bit, a bit of variety of that. But then I think I think the kicking game as well. Is really good for the All Blacks. Seeing those attacking spaces and then being able to go back to the contestable games. Like I thought, Aaron Smith's kicking game was was great. And the times that we did kick, um, we were able to get up and contest the ball. And then you know, some of the times you get it, you get able to get a turnover, or sometimes it's just done there and they're not be able to tackle that. So um, a lot of great things that the All Blacks have done. But knowing um, that group, I wish we'll be able to see what um, what's coming for them, and um, it'll just be more so can they back up their performance with their physicality because that's where it all started and that's where it needs to continue. I also want to mention that Quint Pye try is just the mm. heads up play. They knew. I don't know if you remember, Jamo did that dummy and he tried to have a run instead of box mm. kick and he got caught in that ruck and then it was turned over in that ruck. Mm. So, you know, Bodie and Quinn obviously ID'd, ID'd that because they knew that that kick space and no one was there. So if you, if you don't understand that rugby system, you're probably looking at it going, who's stuffed their job up? Well, it was just that heads up play to know that, you know, Jamo's isolated himself in that ruck, there's a turnover, that's where the space was. It looks easy, but to make those decisions and then execute it on the run um, was was just exceptional. It was, um, you know, that, that that was I felt the difference. You know, that execution when when it came to it, the All Blacks pulled trigger and they nailed it. Mm. The precision of his chase was amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, and just on there, I just actually just reading an article about that uh, about 20 minutes ago around Quintapai was actually calling a different uh, different um, call. But Bodhi, um, they both had a quick look at each other and then Bodhi saw the space, like you said, J would have seen Jamo or there was nobody sweeping him behind and they've been able to put that kick under a, quite a lot of lot of pressure from um, the Irish defence and then been able to Quinn hold his line to be able to not be offside and then score that try. Um, I thought it was fantastic. And probably one thing the All Blacks probably want to want to work on defensively because traditionally the New Zealand Nines want to end up being quite close to the ruck or slipping into the line to help out the forwards. And, you know, I thought Ireland were able to see that space as well. Just in mind, you know, Johnny Sexton put a nice little kick in. And then, you know, I think, I don't know who actually regathered it, uh, Jippa, but then it could have been an inside ball to Jammer to score that try. But Geordie Barrett ends up intercepting that ball. So I think, you know, we're talking around how clinical the All Blacks were. But I think defensively, that's probably one area they want to try to suss out when it comes to their pendulum of their back third and how we can use our nine maybe to get in that pocket a little bit more to cover those attacking kicks that um, Ireland got in that first half. Yeah, well, you've got a couple of options there. You can sometimes hold your 13 back, but then that slows your line speed pressure, you know, so that 13 can sort of go halfway house to get back to cover the quick. Rico's probably quick enough, um, but I, I just think, you know, you, there's no better feeling than um, forcing an error, error and scoring from it mm. like they did with the Sever Reese try. So you want that 13 committed. Mm. So I think it's just getting that balance right um, between who does cover that space and behind and maybe not always utilising your nine to slip to create that one extra defender. Let's talk about that defence on the line too, because, I mean, Enrico Ioane in particular. It seems like, even within little tiny moments, he's making extraordinary decisions right there about where to put his arm and where to dislodge the ball, how to roll the player. Like, the skill level in what he did is huge. Well, Leicester as well, and rolling with the player, getting under them. Like, uh, you know, we've seen it, a lot throughout Super Rugby, but it's another level up, and the speed and the tempo, and 
even um, before that first try, man, like it was just like ball and there's just black jerseys popping up, getting around the corner, popping up, getting around the corner. And and you're almost like, that's early on in the game. And I was thinking, how are they going to sustain this? Like the defensive efforts were just massive on the back of those mm. those efforts. And I think it's there's a genuine thought to try and knock that ball out. You know, like that, there's, we're talking seconds. Um, but yeah, the defensive effort of the midfielders um, but also the wingers I think in and around the ruck sometimes as well um, was exceptional because they, the ball was coming so quick you can't always get those guys to fill so mm. they have to tighten um, and, and you know they're good for it mm. but again I think Ireland will make those adjustments and, and they'll be able to um, I suppose punish them a little bit more if they do caught, get caught that short around the ruck again. We talk a lot about comms, the, don't we? Um, sorry, Bryn. Just, we talk a lot about comms on attack, but comms on Debrin, like, can you talk a little bit about what's required to achieve what was being achieved in and around their own line? Oh, I think it's better to make really good decisions first and foremost. Sorry, actually not first and foremost. The physicality is probably the biggest thing in being able to dominate the collision. But sometimes you're not able to get that. And coming back to Jip's point, if you don't get that, then it's been able to, as your winger or your kind of second five, if you're in that kind of zone, um, you've got to bring your forwards out and have the confidence to be able to bring them out with you. So then you've got a, a line that's been able to um, come up to defensively or just hold back a touch and then make a decision a little bit later due to the, um, the, the ball speed. But... Um, it comes around a lot, uh, Ross, and I think it's the micro comms between each other, between each player. And so, you know, you've got the halfback that traditionally, you know, we'll talk as much as we can, which we've got our eyes pretty much based in it around that ruck and trying to talk to your rock or your action, your first two defenders either side of the ruck and communicating that and seeing how the player's going. But, you know, if it's a, you know, if it's a midfielder or a second five, sometimes, you know, it's identifying who's next to you. And if you've got a prop, you know, you probably can't afford to leave them, to leave them behind too much. So you've got to be a little bit more... Um, passive and connected with them but you know if you've got a, an Artie Severe or a Six you've got more of a license to knowing that they can probably deal with a bit of footwork and can make decisions on the run if there's animation in front of them so I think it's just collectively you've all got to be on the same page and it's those micro comms um, if you're quiet you know you're indecisive you're not going to know who you're on so you know coming back to your midfielders your halfbacks guys coming around the corner talking to each other saying come with me or knowing that it's slow or quick ball um, there's a lot of things around it but for me I just think it's you could probably might be a little bit different but the micro comms between the guy inside and outside you gives you confidence to then make a decision whether it's a tackle or you've got animation in and around you from lines coming at, um, um, on attack. But um, you know, communicating that all the time um, is pretty important defensively. Sometimes you, as a forward, I find it's about that two-way comms. You know, it's listening. Your comms is actually yeah. listening to what you're being told to do. So your halfback's huge and then probably your first midfielder setting that width of when you're coming around the corner. And, and you've just got to trust them. And sometimes you, you, you make a tackle, you're getting off the deck and you're just, you're literally just going, where do I need to be? You're listening. And it'll be someone like Bryn saying, Jippy, you've got to go, you get round, get round. And then straight away you're gone, you're in the space. Then you can make the decision when you're in the space, but you've got to actually trust the people around you just to listen, to get there first and foremost, to be influential. And if you go back um, to a number of times on the, on the line there, some of the work those tight forwards, um, you know, Sam Kane is doing in terms of making double efforts, tackle, coming round, tackle, coming round, and they're just trying to fill space. And I, I think it's a ballsy play, Bryn, when those midfielders stay a little bit wider because they trust they're coming. Mm. It'd be very mm. easy to creep in and get caught tight mm. and then get burnt on the outside, but they trust that they're coming. And that's all down to two-way cons. So often we think it's all about what's being said, but it's how you, you absorb it and listen as well. And, being a forward, that's that's most of your role on D is making sure that you listen. And that's a lot of time and training during the week to get those things so you just understand each other. Yeah, but it's like, I don't know, halfbacks' voices are so distinctive. I don't know. It's like it's, <laughs> the, it's, like it's born into them. It's, it's just you, the, you can't miss it. You, you can't not hear it. Mm. Um, because it's always talking. Yeah, like. it, must, <laughs> it just must be always constant chat. <laughs> But I think also as well, um, what's really important, you're talking around listening, Jip, and being able to obviously communicate it, but I think it's understanding and making good decisions of what that is because look, you don't want to be making you know 20 odd tackles, but so if you can influence a game of like someone makes a really good chop tackle and the guy, the first arrival that's on their ball jackling, then you've got opportunity to get the ball to slow it down or you get a turnover. Yeah. So again, it's been about being able to make really good decisions. Like, Artie Severe, you know, how many, I think there's a lot of times in games with big moments, it's 10, 12 phases, and you could see him sniffing around, just waiting, all right, I can influence myself here. But he doesn't do it out of system. It doesn't, like, cause his teammates to put him in that much trouble. 
where he makes um, a bad read and then it costs you a try or being able to cost you a penalty. But I think also it's really good around that, making crucial decisions around the ruck because you don't want to be making 20, 30 tackles. If you can stop it right then and there um, as a jackler, then it's a great way defensively as well to be able to help your team out and, um, and I guess, stunt the momentum of the team when they have it. I'm stressed out just listening to it. <laughs> you know, like the idea of being on your own line and having to take in all of these things. But it's also like, you know, for all the young halfbacks out there, it's using the name as well, like Jipper, get there. Because mm. you hear your own name. Do you know what I mean? So you yeah. straight away. So it's actually an art. It's a role in teams. Like it's not, it's not aimless chat. They're not just yelling, you know, rubbish. Mm. It's really specific and to the point of what they need right then and there. Which isn't always easy for them when it's you know held to scatter, but they have to be everyone's eyes and eyes, and and you know we have to utilise our ears. Speaking of, that's, um, sorry, on. sorry, and just to finish, just to finish off on that, that's why it's really because you know if you're a forward and it's gone, you know, let's say hypothetically, two minutes and you're defending your line and it's gone 16, 17 phases, and you know we're all everybody's tired, especially your big boys if they scrum and do lineouts, and they're hearing same way, same way. But if you actually get a voice and a name on it, and it's like, Sam, go same way, or Sam, stay, look up and watch the rover, it just helps them out so much. And so um, as a young nine coming through, I think it's important that your, your, your micro comms and a name and action, I think what you said just perfect, because if you don't do that, um, you tend to not make good decisions defensively. We'll talk a little bit about yelling aimlessly later on when we talk about the England game. <laughs> but uh, let, let's, let's move into uh, this what happened on the weekend with Scott Barrett. So obviously there are a lot of people surprised to see him named. Bryn, not so much. He, he made the he call. Picked he picked it. Um, Somehow I feel like there is an inside <laughs> little uh, shoulder tap um, there. <laughs> he just saw it coming. Nostradamus Bryn picked it. And uh, what did you make of him, Bryn? Would you expect him to be being there for the next two weeks now, considering how well he played at six, Scott Barrett? Oh, I, I think so. I think probably most of that team, um, really, that 23 or 15, because um, to put that kind of performance on and I guess what we talked around physicality and, and around the breakdown, and I, and I think Scooter does that pretty well on, on both sides of the ball. And, and yes, hopefully, um, you know, you want to continue to keep seeing that technique and he isn't going to get a yellow card or a red card but um, you know his line out option is really good being able to have another person in, in the set piece is really important uh, but I think what he does do is he does all, does all the dirty work you know that you probably don't see you know we love seeing Artie Severe and his ability to be able to um, score tries and being able to influence with his attacking game but you know Scooter's really great around that defensive work and you know, I think he topped the tackle count and his ability to be able to get over the game line as well I think with his hard carries and being able to put that ball out for Aaron Smith they've used as the examples he did that great on the weekend so um, yeah, I find it pretty hard if you would see any change this week. There might be one or two, possibly, but um, I think he's done enough to be able to um, warrant another go at that number six jersey, especially with what we're wanting um, on the weekend and he was able to do that for them. I think he's done more than enough. Uh, he's in my form 15. I, I thought he was exceptional. And um, he, he allows... He's a different style of six, and he allows, um, as we spoke about, you know, Sam Kane and, and Artie to be on the field together um, because he... You know, as Bryn says, covers a number of areas which allows them to sort of excel. So um, I, I think he, he made a hell of a fist of it. Mm. Um, and, and, and it's not even the stuff that we saw. Like if you just watch him, like he just little niggly things of hitting defensive rucks to try and bobble that ball for the half back at the back. You know, there was always a purpose to his play. Every, everything was, you know, I've used it a, a few times on this, but everything was calculated and, and the execution was on point and, and he was a big part of that. And making sure that that platform is set for, for others to thrive. As a coach, when you make a call like this, you know, it's one of those all or nothing things. They copped it in 2019 for making this call. This time around, it appeared to be right. Um, do they now need to stick with it long term to make sure that this is um, the way forward? You, you, surely you can't jump in and out of calls like this. No, I don't know, because there, there are... Um, different oppositions. I do think they're going to have to give opportunity um, for someone like mm -hmm. Akira, um, but whether that's this week, I'm not too sure. I think um, I think Artie went to blindside when Peter Gus came on, so maybe they're you know, looking at him as more of an eight, so uh, potentially that third test may be an opportunity to give someone if, if the series is all said and done. Um, but also different oppositions require different style of players, so it's not just going, this is our 1-15, yeah, well, 123, it's, it's really 
um, I suppose specific to the game plan and what you want to execute on the day against what opposition and, and they wanted to come at the breakdown mm. they wanted to win collisions and there is no better man than Scott Barrett and he played the full 80 moved into lock you wouldn't even you know blinked um, with with the work he did when he moved into lock as well I can't imagine that's going to change they're not going to want to start losing the collisions or the breakdown so no you know. no but it's not to say that um, Akira can't do that yeah he, he did show last year he can do it so um, where Scott's biggest strength is a set piece, I believe. Like he, he will, he's a lock. So him scrumming at six is a, is is like a lock scrumming. <laughs> you know, next year you, you're going to be loving it if you're George Bauer, aren't you? Yeah. And, and that's a big part of that scrum dominance. Everyone looks at the front row when it goes wrong, but they look at the front row when it goes right. But it's an actual eight. It's a full eight. But and and having your Lucy's head down, focused on scrummaging before popping up and looking is massive and getting that dominance that we saw the All Blacks have up front. So, um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's got a lot of um, things to offer, but I still think there are other sixes that can offer things that he quite can't do as well. Mm. Peter Gus, Brent, I was really impressed with the way he used the ref one for that try. The outstanding use <laughs> of the ref on defence to take out the flanker. But two, what did you make of him in his time on the field? Yeah, good. I think, you know, any time you can have the um, his kind of prowess off the, off the back of a scrum, and look, that comes back to your point, Jip, around the scrum, being able to set that up because you know, the loose forwards were so concentrated on the, on that scrum, he was able to get on the outside and and um, was able to score that try. But um, yeah, I think a little bit of a tough start, I think, you know, came on a bit of early nerves, but um, he brought in his form from, from Super Rugby. It's been able to have those, those hard dominant carries, he's been able to Get over the advantage and, and work, and so um, yeah, I thought it, I thought he was great, and to be able to have that that meat pie as well, especially off the back of a scrum, so how happy he was, and how happy um, his teammates were from being able to get that because um, it's a massive strength of his, and um, it comes back to what the forwards have been able to do up front, but um, it's a massive weapon that he can use moving forward, knowing now how many times he's done that for the for the Chiefs in Super Rugby Pacific, and um, he's a weapon off the back of a scrum. I think it was Carberry who he yeah. ran. <laughs> over or through but geez he didn't look too keen to make the tackle <laughs> I don't know if I would be either but um, he certainly it was no touch yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah Pittagas was great um, and, and he, he warmed into it like Bryn said but um, I think like once he's now he's got his first cap out of the way you'll see him get even um, better and better and more confident um, the more minutes he gets what about less defying under Goo? I thought he was good. You know, I mentioned him before in the defensive efforts. Like he, he's an effort player. You know, so is Sevu. Like uh, they don't, they give up on nothing. They are always within their system and their role. Um, you know, and, and that's what makes the Crusaders so great. And that's what's got them to that All Black level. And that was no different. And, and the one thing I liked about Leicester is before Jordy Barrett's try, he could have tried to go again or push it because he's on debut and wants to try, but he just recycles it. It's those little things that are. You know, you can't take for granted. Like it would be easy to get hyped up and try and he tried to, you know, mm. bowl them over and then go. Oh, I'm a chance here to release and go and knock it on, but he just stayed calm. He knew it wasn't his moment or time, and and you know they score the next phase. Um, that's why he'll remain in All Black for a long time is those little selfless decisions and it's that work off the ball as effort on D. I just thought was exceptional. Uh, give us an insight, Brent, into him. I suppose um, off the field, what's he like as a trainer? What's he like as a professional? No, he, he's great. I think I saw it from a young age. I mean, Les came in probably a couple of years ago and just had a really massive growth mindset. Understood that um, he was a young fella coming through and he wants to learn. He consistently wants to keep learning. And even um, him speaking and I can hear in the media, he, he wants to go to the Obelix to be able to learn from the people that are up in that environment. So, um, you know, you could probably say the last two years, you, he could get complacent and thinking that he's got it all sorted out. But no, he's, he's just definitely not like he's a, he's a professional. Um, and the greatest thing for a young guy coming through, he wants to consistently get to get better, and he's competitive. Um, you know, he's had George Bridge the last two, three years that he's been able to watch and from afar, and then I guess taking his position through his, his through his way of he's playing um, has kind of just given the opportunity to be the All Blacks. But um, I think, like you said, I think probably 12 months ago, um, a very similar game we played against the Rebels, and it was that kind of game for us to go into the final. Um, and he actually did a couple of double movements trying to make that extra effort play. And so it's great to be able to see him now um, to understand that situational football is so much better in those examples, knowing that you don't have to do everything by yourself. Um, you can, you know, go with the advantage line and set up for your mate. And, you know, Aaron Smith gives that ball to be able to have Barrett to score. So um, his growth in that has been great as well. He, he identifies things that he needs to work on and he wants to get better. And um, he's learning, which I think is great for a young man of his age to have those kind of traits. 
because mm, he could have gone for the corner. Mate, and that's what I was just about to say as well. He went back in field. Like it was, it was, a, it was such a selfless run. Mm. Like it really, yep. it was like again calculated. They knew they just needed to build phase, build pressure, and they'll eventually get over. Um, he, yeah, and, and that's what impressed me the most. And I was at the game live, so it's like you just see the work off the ball. Is you know, mm. that, it's like they're just as hungry to carry as they are to tackle. Both him and Sibu, like they they work really hard. Now, for our Irish viewers um, and listeners around the world, we've, they've listened to us go on about the All Blacks for half an hour. What about them, Bryn? Where did it go wrong? Where do they need to lift their game? Oh, I think they can take a, a lot of confidence. Like I thought the way they started, geez, you know, 18 odd phases, Oof. and I guess you know, the ability of Jamison to be able to, you know, go back and forth or around the heart defense and really asking questions of of the All Blacks and even just after half time as well, very similar. Um, and so I think physicality is going to be a big one. I know we harp on about this and it's such a boring answer sometimes, but you know, physicality wins the game and you know, probably the All Blacks won that battle quite a lot and they had their opportunities. And so the difference was any time they made a, they made a, a mistake or, you know, they, yeah, they made a mistake or something like that, the All Blacks pounced on that and were able to really just um, impose themselves and been able to score points off that. And so you look at the 55th and 60th minute, you know, Carberry and, and Van der Fleer, um, you know, they have that two tries that they could have scored, which the game was kind of in the balance there. I know the score probably didn't um, dictate that, show that, but I thought, you know, the game was in the balance in that 55th, 60th minute where if they score those tries, then, um, you know, they could have put more pressure on the All Blacks and it could have been a closer result off that. But, um, you know, the times that they did get held up and what was it, maybe four times that they didn't score were close to the line. So, um, you know, if they can get a few of those and, can take the confidence from the first minute of their 18 phases and just after sec the second half, and they get that right along with the physicality. Um, they'll take a lot of confidence, um, you know, going to Forsyth Bar as well, which um, it'll be it'll be um, nice and dry there, and um, you know they'll be able to try and execute their game plan, which we've talked a lot around their face play shape. They've been able to ask questions. Um, it's going to help if it's under a dry roof as well. So yeah, those are the things that I probably see that the, that the Irish need to do. I don't think it's panic stations for them. Um, like like yeah. I said, like Bryn speaks about that physicality and I suppose or winning collisions and people are probably going oh yeah you say that all the time but just to get an understanding is all those direct carries all those tackles all those rucks cleaned before that five to six minute period where they scored 21 points as in the All Blacks did is all because the tank's been sucked dry mm -hmm. so those opportunities those moments of slip you know it mentally just allowed them to expose it but then also the physicality of defence with a turnover that led to Severus's try um, we've spoken about the physicality on Jamison Gibson Park to get that turnover for the grubber through try, and then they're trying to spread the field. Aaron Smith heads up play through the middle try, and and that's how quick the game can turn on. So it's and it's five minutes, five or six minutes, and outside of that, they were in the they were in the contest. They they still are in the contest of this, and I think the other key thing is um, Sexton going off. He is almost like a coach out on the field. He has an ability to adjust on the run like no other. That's why he's played so many tests. And having that sort of now, and that's nothing against Carberry, it's not that he's a bad player, it's just mm. Sexton is a special breed. Um, and everyone that plays with him seems to speak so highly of him. What they speak to is his ability to ID in games mm. live and make adjustments and be able to bring players with him in and around. And I think him going off was, was a huge hole. So, um, you know, we, we, we have spoken a lot about the All Blacks. Um, because sometimes, just like when the Irish beat us in Dublin, sometimes you've actually just got to acknowledge the opposition played really well. Mm. Um, and they did things that didn't enable you to get into your game. And around those collisions and the, and the precise nature of the execution was the difference on the night. Does it dictate the rest of the series? No, not at all. Mm. Would the All Blacks be quite happy with the fact that those options that Johnny Sexton seems to find, Bryn, um, no matter where he is on the field, might be gone with Carberry there. Can Carberry step up to that same level? Oh, I think he can. It just, you know, when you take that kind of person out of, out of a team, um, you know, it just kind of changes your game. And that's no disrespect to Carberry. He just hasn't had the experience of sexing in big games and understanding, you know, in, in play, in game, the kind of things that you need to see and been able to execute, I guess, from that. So, but if you're probably Ireland and there is no um, sexting for that first game, I can imagine that forward pack will be wanting to, um, to bring them to get them over the line uh, with their collision. So, um, and then, it, you know, you might have the ability to possibly to bring Conor Murray on a little bit earlier, possibly, um, you know, with the ability of Sexton going off and bringing on his experience. And that's no disrespect to Jammer, because I think 
Jamie needs to start, and he brings that um that kind of attacking flair that they need. And when they are at, when they are going and winning physicality and collisions, um, like you said in that first try, like I said in that first try, um, that's the DNA of of the Irish. And so it's probably a good, it's probably just a good, I guess, understanding for that group because uh, there has been a lot of hype around them, and, and so they should have had, they, so they should have because of how well they've been playing. But um, you know, anytime you get a kind of tail up like that and bring back down to earth. I know they would have known how hard the challenge would have been coming to New Zealand, but you know, anytime you can really get that and looking back in that review thinking, Oof, we weren't that far off, but we ended up losing by, you know, 20 odd points just because we didn't get things right. Like you said, Jip, there was that 10 minute period of three tries and that's all it takes against the All Blacks. So um, I can imagine that forward pick, I think is really crucial for them. Uh, if Sexton's out to be able to, to really win the test match and being able to make it a real dogfight of the scenes that we saw in Dublin been able to get that collision and get that quick ball um, that we're so accustomed to seeing with Ireland in the last 12 to 18 months. Totally agree with that. Numbers 1 to 8 will be key um, if, if Sexton doesn't start. But I do think there's a way for them to be just as successful with Carberry because the difference is when Sexton goes off for an HIA and he's not all there, he can't contribute. Whereas this week, Carberry, if he's not playing, Carberry's in the saddle for the whole week, he's running the cutter. But also, Sexton may run the water. So you've still got his nouse out there, you've still got him vocally in Carberry's ear to say, hey, are you looking at this, have you seen this? And that makes a big difference, it, it, it seriously does, whereas you know, without him there at all, it does leave quite a hole. Mm. Be like an NRL trainer, basically in the back <laughs> yeah. line the Be entire like, time. Um, Alfie, Alfie does for the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well be playing. Absolutely. Now, what about, Bryn, you were at this game, the, the Māori All Blacks versus Ireland, mm. the midweek game. Was there anyone that you saw in there from an Irish point of view, maybe, that you think could be a crack at playing the All Blacks this week? Um, I think probably maybe one person I've been thinking, uh, Bundy Aki. Um, look, I thought he was great um, for that Irish um, team, for, probably in a, losing, in a losing game. Not not a lot of them you know, probably would have thought that they um, were good enough to be able to, um, I guess, stake their claim to be able to be in this Test match series to start with, but I think what he, what he played against the Maldives, his ability to be able to get over the line advantage line, and that's not to say the um, the Irish midfielder didn't do a job in that, but you know, if I'm thinking one guy that probably staked the claim and um, probably the added motivation of being, him being in New Zealand as well, I know that he'll want to be able to get out there and be able to influence just being at home, and I know it'll be emotional and you obviously have those emotional juices that'll build up for him, but um, I think one thing that I've seen enough uh, from Bundy that he could be one person that I reckon um, could possibly um, you know, start a test and go for the next two games. He certainly gives them a platform. Like, I was going to say Bundy as well, and I was surprised that he wasn't named. Like, when I saw him named in the midweek team, I was like, man, is that a sign that he's not going to start? And it's, he is different. He, he, he will set such a strong um, platform yes. over the game line. Like, he doesn't just run the hard lines. He actually knows he's got a bit of finesse. He's got a bit of footwork. And I think when he came on, you could see he just wants to be part of the game. He wants to um, set the tone and send a message that he's here in New Zealand. So I, I'd love to see him in the 12 um, for, for Ireland. And I think it, it would be a really, really good fit for someone like Carberry to have a bailout option like that. Mm. Because if it's not going to plan, you know you, you're always going to get gain line with him and he's going to give you the ability to have time to make a decision on the next play. Um, so I, I think he, and he was huge in that game against Māori. He was, um, he was into everything and, and probably the one player that was the difference in, in keeping them within a sniff. Mm. And it, great leadership in that way, wasn't it? Yeah, it was action leadership, wasn't mm. it? He, he didn't um, need to do too much talking. It was, it was more of a follow me. Um, and I suppose the other issue is, is I suppose their props. They've got a few injuries there, so um, how how it may look and shape um, this week around that. An area that we probably said was their biggest strength coming into this yeah. tour. It just shows like you have to acknowledge the impact of an end of year tour for the All Blacks right at the end of the season, and this is at the end of um, you know the Northern Hemisphere's season. So you could see that there are some tiring. Um, bodies just through load and, and the expectation. They're not even expected to be the best at international level. It's, you know, at club level they're expected to front up. And I'm not making excuses, it's just a reality. It's the long season up north. Yeah, and it's a long season um, for the Orbits when they go up there and it's it, it's hard to find a gauge how much weight you put on that um, and, and how, um, how much it plays in terms of these results. But I think after the, as Bryn said, after the pump up, and then a little bit of a humbling, I think you, you'll see a pack that's pretty determined this week. Mm -hmm. What about on the other side from the Māori All Blacks? 
obviously Zan Sullivan was incredible. Um, what else did you like out of what they did? Oh, I was, I was there. Oh, it was great. And I think um, pretty similar to the message that we've been saying for the All Blacks game, um, the Maldives had a lot of opportunities in that first half due to the mistakes of what the Irish were able, what the Irish were doing. So, you know, I thought Sean Stevenson oh. was fifty minute cameo. He was um he was outstanding. You know, he hasn't probably had a lot of opportunities just due to due to the Chiefs, had a few injuries and then wasn't able to get back in the side. But look, he was at his electric best and he always seems to do that, uh, in the Maldives jersey. So look, I thought Shooter and even uh, Garden Bishop, you know, their pairing on the wings, they were um, they were great. But then probably one guy that I didn't think gets a lot of uh, pats on the backs, but I thought Cam saw four for um for the Maldives was was outstanding. Um, you know, a guy that hasn't played a lot of Super Rugby, has played a little bit of Mighty 10 Cup Bunnings NPC and then got given an opportunity um, to play in that number six role. And I thought his his ball carries were tough. He was able to give it, get over the advantage line and really set up that kind of quick ball for Brad Weber in that first half. So, um, and just on that as well, I thought Brad, his 50 minutes was was great. Uh, we talk around Aaron Smith and his tempo. Um, you know, if he was to get injured, I know Finlay Christie's there, but... You know, Brad was was his tempo was outstanding. He obviously was able to influence getting a try, but he really stood up. I thought, and you know, after a lot of a lot of disappointment, not being selected for the All Blacks, um, I thought he was great. And so, uh, those are a couple of guys that I thought were, were great. Other than obviously Zan Sullivan, who was my man of the match. Yeah, I mean, pretty similar. To be, honest. I, I thought Sean was just simply sensational. When he puts on performances like that. You just wonder how he doesn't get more minutes at Super, don't you? It's like, I know there's some quality players ahead of him, but man, he's he's just got that X factor about him, um, that long range try. Um, but I, I think another guy, I, I thought um, Cam Suofu was outstanding as well, Brendan, and sort of put himself on the map. Uh, but I thought mm. Cullen Grace put his hand up again, you know, after a big final. Uh, he had another big day at the office at line out time um, in the carry and the collision work. And, and I was really pleased for Kurt Eklund. I thought he was really strong. You know, he, he got put under the pump a little bit. Um, and I'll, I'll defend him as a hooker here. It's not always the hooker's <laughs> fault, a line out. Um, and, and he bounced back. Um, and it just shows the sort of character he has um, to, to bounce back from a tough week to, to performing really well, in my opinion. Do you guys have a group, like a counselling session? Each week where, <laughs> yeah, you, know, you get around the one hooker who's getting <laughs> chastised. Yeah, no, we just all come together. It's like Captain Planet. We all just unite. <laughs> um, and then, and then one more guy just that missed out on the All Blacks who made a big statement. We mentioned Brad, but I thought Tyrell Lomax was strong as well. Mm. Um, I know he's been caught into the All Blacks with Nepo and a little bit of an injury, but I thought he had a he had a massive game, and, and that platform was crucial to that first half success of the Maori. Mm. He's developed. Uh, I suppose quite a bit of experience over the last few years, hasn't he? You know, he still feels kind of like a new kid on the block, but actually he's he's becoming a bit of a veteran. And he played like it. Yeah, absolutely. And and you think of that pack, the amount of work they did to hold the Irish out on that line, like mm. especially in that second half, they made them earn every point. And the defensive efforts, the that players you know, talk about the All Blacks trying to hold people up. I think it was Curdy, um, Kurt Eklund did a great job of um, getting under the ball once or twice and. Um, Cullen Grace hitting guys back, Tyrell Lomax. So these guys that could easily have kicked stone seem to go into that Maldives environment. And it seems a pretty special environment, Bryn, in terms of um, connecting with, their, their, I suppose, their family history and, and playing for something bigger than themselves. I don't know, it just, it just has an aura about them. And I think the Hucker set the standard mm. at the start of the game. And then, you know, the way they performed, it can go either way on that situation, can't it, Bryn, the emotion of a Hucker yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, it was a fantastic performance. Yeah, I thought it was, and I think um, even Clayton, I think he brought it up around uh, in his post-match around. Um, there was a lot of emotional side. Sean Wainui was probably a big, big part of that week as well. And knowing that um, they talked about him a lot and being able to you know, put in a performance of him and his whanau for what he's done for the Moldy jersey. But like you said, it can be almost too emotional, and you don't get the you don't get the the game right with just playing on too much emotion, not being process driven. But um, for whatever reason, it really clicked in that first half. Um, you know, the attacking side, of, but defensively, I don't know how many times you know, they didn't get um, parity at set piece. Um, they didn't feel, the Irish didn't feel that they wanted to go to scrum or line outs. They wanted to, to pick and go. And, you know, they stopped them three or four times. And so uh, that was probably the one in the game that I thought, even though they had scored a lot of points in that first half, but it just kind of dented, um, I guess, their their belief and not being able to score points there. And um, you are right, Jeff, it does go a little bit deeper when you are in that Maldives group. Um, you're not only just playing for yourself, but a lot of those boys are playing for their people. I mean, for their heritage and our, and our ancestors and got guys that have gone before us knowing that we've talked around um, wanting to play tier one nations, not getting opportunities, being overlooked and not getting to play uh, meaningful test matches. So uh, 
um, it all kind of, I guess, came together. And um, thankfully, um, even though there was a lot of emotion on the side of it, they were able to go out there, execute, and uh, put on a, a pretty famous result for uh, for Mould Rugby again. It was pretty emotional, especially after Sean Wainui's um, partner came out into the middle of the field with the kids. Like my wife turned to me and she was trying to say something completely rugby related. She's like, "Are you all right?" <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was like, "You're gonna have to give me a moment." Like, yeah, it was. That it was, was yeah. It was a really nice, nice touch from the Irish as well. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was. Was it Foley that um, the Maori presented a jersey? I think that you guys were playing Munster. Um, I can't remember, but. Mm. Um, something similar. So to see that gesture um, returned was was a really nice touch for for Sean and his family. Let's have a look at some of the other games. Uh, the Australia England game blew my mind for a lot of reasons that really had nothing to do with rugby. Oh. There were some things going on in that game that were niggly and bizarre. Uh, let's go. We referred to it earlier: the screaming and the line out. <laughs> uh, that's not kosher. You can't go about doing that. I think there's a genuine agreement. Um, but there, we have seen more and more often this has happened, but refs step in to just say, hey, look, they've got to get their call. Um, you know, players will always look for an inch to sort of push the boundaries um, to see if they can get their opposition off. But I, I thought the Wallabies showed good composure and uh, managed to get through it. Um, yeah, I suppose you're talking about the headbutt as well. Like yeah. that, that was a bit of a brain explosion. And that's what, um, you know, you always got to get that balance right. Um, as, a, as a forward, you want to set the tone, you want to have a presence, you want to let them know you're there. Um, but it, that was, yeah, I mean, we can't have that in our game, especially around the amount of work uh, World Rugby and unions are trying to do around head protection. Um, yeah, it just wasn't the, the smartest move and he was punished accordingly. Mm. And he was lucky that his team played the way they did through the first part of the second half to get them through, you know, and, yeah. and win it easily in the end, really. But a massive pack on the back for Noah Lodosio to um, step up and probably shows that he didn't have time to think about it or overthink it. You know, he was sort of thrust into it um, without any preparation. Sometimes that whole week build up, you know, the nerves build. You know, he's had a week watching Quaid prepare and then, you know, he goes down and warm up and he's just got to step up and do it. Don't overthink it, just step up and do it. And he did it. Mm. You know, it wasn't perfect, you know, obviously yellow card to finish with, but I thought it was a really, really solid performance and a pressure cooker going down to 14. You know, everyone looks to the 10 for direction and you've got to play us in the right part of the field, we'll make our tackles, but get us in the right part of the field to at least give us a chance to win this test match and they did that in the inside. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I'm not sure, Bryn, whether you saw what Eddie Jones had to say. And, uh, it's an interesting thing to say because we've had a lot of red cards recently, so we can almost test this. You can probably get a scientist onto this, you know, to really back up these stats. He said that after the red card, the referee favoured the Australians because that's what always happens. Now, we've had red cards in a lot of games this year. Do you feel that referees feel sorry for the team that loses a man or woman and, you know, helps them out a little bit? Um, no, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, it's classic Eddie Jones, isn't it, to be able to, I guess, have a talking point for that because, um, look, the Australians were down to, for the red, red card the whole game. So, you know, for England, for England, you should be really giving yourself to win that game. And so it takes away all the kind of... I guess external noise around what's been said around how they should have won that game and I guess the way they didn't perform um, to, to get that result. So, no, I, I don't think they do. I think, to be honest, we probably should get Ben O'Keefe on here and ask him <laughs> if they actually think that I, there's... Uh, you know, oh, yeah, go, so go, Jim. I, I don't reckon... I, I think this is Eddie trying to get an adjustment for the second test. Mm. Um, you know, he's yeah. always got a plan. So he's got a mind game because mm. after I saw those comments and I thought, oh, I didn't really read it that. So I went back and watched... Afterwards, and, and everything was fair in my in my interpretation of the laws. Everything was fair and very clear, um, and, and he can't say that we haven't seen. If you go shoulder to head, um, if anything, mm. the northern hemisphere have said that the southern hemisphere aren't harsh enough. Mm. So I, I don't know. Um, it, it's potentially. I just think it's um, you know he's he's playing games for the test two and, <laughs> and and just trying to get people to think and. And then look, it worked because it made me think. I was like, oh, really? And, and went out a look. But no, um, I, I thought it was very well ref, to be honest. And, and they went down to 13 as well. And, and, and they scored a couple of tries and, and made it a little bit closer. But no. Yeah. And just to finish on that, um, you know, 
the ability to be able to stay in the game, Jip, and then to have the last 10 minutes, really, you know, it was um, Van Gaha and then obviously Pete Samu with some great footwork to really that ice it. Awesome feet. Oh, mate, like I've seen Pete do that, you know, time and time again with his time with the Crusaders. His ability to talk about impact player uh, when players are tired, uh, being able to bring a guy on like Pete Samu to show that kind of footwork, what he can bring, um, was great. So um, I guess one thing for the Australians, um, the way that they finished, you know, it's a kind of, I was never really in doubt after Pete Samu scores, but, you know, to kind of score two tries at the back end of a test match would probably leave a bit of a sour taste, which is probably going to be great for Dave Rennie. Actually, it's probably just say, hey, boys, you know, luckily, good to get good result, good fight back and resilience. But um, I guess we'll have a little bit of a sour taste in their, in their, in their mouths uh, just with how they finished that game. But great, great, great win for them, um, especially under trying con- con- uh, conditions and I guess having um, a red card very early in the game. Now, I might be showing a generational thing here, but I was watching this game with my uh, father-in-law and when Banks did his injury... Yeah. I, I couldn't look at the screen. I was like, oh, that's so, that, that's harsh, that's broken. My father, all you reckon it's broken? I'm like, well, I'm no doctor, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that arm is snapped in half, and I'm not laughing at the injury. I was just, I just thought it was, uh, was Wait, it clear and obvious to you guys? Like this. It looked it's bad. Arm like, it looked yeah. Like this. yeah. Oh, oh, mate, yeah. I'm, oh. I'm, glad, I'm glad it wasn't just me. I was like, that is clear and obvious. It's a, it's a broken arm. Let's see, like, walk it off. Oh, I don't know, but he even asked me in the morning, he goes, oh, has it been confirmed? I'm like, mate, it's confirmed, like... <laughs> oh, yeah, it was nasty. Even the way that it, it suddenly oh, his shoulder went back in as well. That was, it was so... Yeah, to be honest, I couldn't take my eye off it, though. Oh, I did. I had to watch it again and again and again, oh. and they replayed it again and again and yeah. again. Um, so... Oh, it's horrible. Um, yeah. I, I, hope he, I hope he recovers fast, and as I say, I wasn't bringing it out like it was a funny thing. I just, I just felt... Uh, my my father-in-law has very high standards of um, <laughs> what a broken arm looks like. <laughs> yeah, mate, he'll be sitting on the uh, doorstep with a shotgun <laughs> yeah. waiting for you. Um, that brings up an interesting point, though. Uh, is Jordan Pattaya the guy to go into fullback from here on in? Who's the, the Wallabies fullback? O'Connor. O'Connor? Actually. Yeah. Um, I think a bit of experience, especially if um, how bad Quaid's um, calf is, so... I don't know, uh, you know, James played a lot of 15 for um, the Reds early on and mm. then moved into that 10, so, um, yeah. Don't know, takes that pressure off Noah, I think, because, mm. uh, as I said, like, that was a great week that he just stepped into it, but it's going to be a little bit harder um, when you're in charge of it for, for the lead-in. And, and, I mean, they went into the sheds and Quade didn't look too happy with where his calf was at, so. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so that was 30-28 to Australia. Now, the other close one was South Africa 32, Wales 29. I, I hadn't planned on getting up for this, but you know, a toddler wakes up in the middle of the night and you end up turning on the TV. Mm-hmm. So when I tuned in, it was 18-3. And I was like, what on earth is going on here? And, Lewis Reece uh, Samet was what was going on. <laughs> for a couple of reasons. One, the loftus lights made it look like we we're watching a game from the 1980s. <laughs> and, and, and two, this was a really good Springbok team on paper. Yeah, it was. and and. They had to use every ounce of it to get back into this one, and and I think Wales will look back and just just be so gutted with their discipline. Yeah, you know, like they just they they penalised themselves out of the game and and allowed the Springboks to piggyback and go to something they know and love, and that's their rolling more, um, and then put themselves within that kickable penalty range so late in the game. Um, <clears throat> So crucial that missed conversion. I reckon, in terms of the mindset they would have played at the end there, Bryn. You know, like so, if, if Bigger gets that um, and it's 31-29, they can probably play it out, but they box kick it back, which gave the Springboks the opportunity with ball in hand. Um, and I understand they weren't playing for a draw, which is which is fine. I'm not having to go at the tactics, but just little moments like that they'll look back on, and, and it'll mm. be one that got away and. And one that certainly would have surprised me anyway. Um, I, w- I was picking a pretty convincing win from South Africa. So Wayne Pivak and his men, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the next two tests go because they, they should be buoyed by that. But controlling that discipline will be the key. Mm. Yeah. Both teams will take a lot of disappointment out of it, I suppose, which really builds up to an interesting second test. Yeah. Well, it does, and I think um, traditionally probably the South Africans um, tend to slow uh, have their slow starts, even if they do have a um, have a good team on paper. But um, yeah, I, I guess for Wales, you'd just be gutted because you know with an 18-3 um, head start of you know three Rizemet who 
who I thought was out. Here's in my form 15 this week. Um, opportunity to try one of them, but you know the other one, um, you get him in with a bit of space and no one in front of you. Um, he's got the ability to be able to finish. And so, yeah, I think if you, the thing with the South Africans, you just can't afford to be able to give them penalties, back to back penalties, and get them in that, um, you know, the 22 meter zone where they're going to go to their line out more, and they have so much pay, uh, pay from it. So, um, if you're the Welsh, you want to be probably thinking um, we can take a lot of confidence around how we did play. It's at the attacking side, but discipline uh, and just knowing that you can't give the, the South Africans a shot there. You know, you score what three tries as a penalty try, but you know, you know, theoretically three line out malls, and then um, you know that's what, eighteen, you know, so nineteen, twenty one points just due to that. So um, they'll be disappointed. They'll be disappointed, but um, hopefully they can take confidence and they're not too de- do, too, uh, too dejected from not getting that result. And you know, hopefully they can get better and get back into the series and make it one all going into that third test. Mm. Elton Yankees is a player in South Africa who draws criticism relatively regularly. He's kind of mercurial. Um, some people aren't impressed by his kicking, his decision making. Do you think it's warranted? Oh, he didn't have one of his best games. I think the fact he got subbed um, so early was a clear indication that he wasn't performing. But um, I, I think if that's the starting 10, they, you've got to give him another chance um, for sure. Uh, he, he doesn't play too many bad games. Like he is, he definitely does attract attention. But um, you know, there was a couple of up and unders that didn't go anywhere and um, turnover ball and things like that. But um, I think he's good enough player to give him another crack in, in the ten jersey. Yeah, yeah. And would you make any other changes across that team in the Springboks? I mean, oh mate, I'd always start Malcolm Marks. I don't know yeah. why. I know he's one of the yeah. best impact players, but I just man, he just makes a difference. Um, mm. Uh, whether, whether it's because that one-two punch works really well, um, but I, I don't know. Like I've, I, I just have that guy on the field more often than not. Mm. He just seems to make, he makes things happen. That rig alone makes things happen. When he <laughs> peeled off the back and went oh, at the try line, I was like, good luck. look at that monster. Yeah, yeah. yeah what are you going to do with that? Six percent like, body fat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I, I'm probably not drastic changes, um, but. I think I think if if they're going to not give um, Yanchi's another go, then Faf de Klerk may have to pay the price as well, because I don't think they either of them worked that well in, in, in the game, and a lot of it's to do with the pressure of the opposition and the breakdown. But I think those two gentlemen wanting to make a statement and prove a point, start them again and say, you know, have a go, is going to be the best result for South Africa, and they'll probably put on an absolute clinic. Mm. Mm. I don't know. How do you think Faf yeah. went? I think, like you know, he's he's a he's a good player, but I think you know, I think he, he's probably had most of his time with with Hondro Pollard, you know, and been able to, I guess, kind of have that kicking base game. And um, but he can, like, he has the ability to be able to play at that up tempo game as well. So I think for him, it's just been able to, it's been able to whoever plays outside him, they comp, they're trying to complement each other a, a little bit better. So um, we know he's got he's got a great box kick and. You know, if they continue to keep going with that, which they probably will. Um, but then I think it's his ability as well that he, he, he can snipe and he can have that up-tempo. So um, it's just, I guess, the ability to be able to do, do them, have those mm-hmm. both games and choose them at the right time, I, I guess, and being able to then execute when he decides to go which style he wants to go, whether it be kicking or being able to have that up-tempo that he can have that ability as well. You want to see him run more? Well, it just depends. I, I, me, for me, I've seen him play at high tempo before and I like seeing that because... He can play on top of teams. He snipes it. Then it brings in his kicking game, his attacking kicks when he does that. But, um, you know, for so long, they they wanted to do the box kicks because it was the, part of their DNA, been able to um, strangle teams, been able to get in those positions of contested balls or kicking it long. So it's just whatever South Africa really wants to do. For me personally, I love a running nine. I love watching him run and being able to manipulate and influence through running and his attacking kicking games. But you know, that's whether they want to do that with the South Africans. So you just never know. Mm-hmm. Willie LaRue offered a lot off the bench you know you could look at promoting him and, and maybe a Willemsa moving to 10 I don't know Yeah. Um, but he's still a hell of a lot that he, he offered um, I, I think probably the best player for me in the, the spring box was Delende I, I thought he was uh, man he's played some consistent footy for some long time um, yeah he it's not just the crash bash stuff he had some finesse about his game and um, you know was a big big reason of turning that game around to give them that front football to allow them to piggyback themselves up the field so um, 
Yeah, I don't think there'd be too many changes. Sometimes when you get a performance like that, it's best to send out the same 23 and say, start again, lads. Mm. Show us why we picked you the first time. Yeah, and watch them react. Yeah. Uh, there will be a reaction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and if there's not, the public will be into them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Argentina, 26. Scotland, 18. Michael Chetka opens it up. Does pretty well in his first outing in San Salvador. Did you like what you saw? I, like, I, I definitely liked... What I saw from an attacking point of view, I thought they were really um, strong in their structures, but also in, in the unstructured stuff coming back from, especially from deep. Um, really enjoyed their nine, Bryn. I thought um, I'm going to look for his name, Bertrano. Um, he he um, he was ex his. You talk about speed and up tempo and playing on top of sides. That you know, giving those big men, um, uh, Pablo Matera, uh, Petty. Yeah. Uh, Matoya, all those guys, front football, charging onto it, getting, and, and they did that for the most part. But they did fall away towards the towards the end and let Scotland back into the game. Um, it was pretty evenly matched, but Argentina, to me, always looked like a side that was going to win. There's a bit to work on, but I think for a new coaching group, you know, and a, and a, and a coach coming from NRL to rugby, um, they made a pretty good fist of things. Um, you yeah, know, first up. Mm. You know, I think as well, I think you look at last year and not being able to win, you know, a lot of test matches, you know, even though, you know, there's a lot of things that they'll want to work on as a group, but, you know, very similar to a lot of these other teams in the world, they all come together. You look at Tonga and the ability to be able to spend time together, very similar to the Argentinians as well, um, being able to come from all corners of the world, come together, and most importantly, getting a result at home. And I think, you know, it was great to see the scenes in, in Argentina, uh, just so it shows how much it means to them to be able to play back at home again and in front of a full crowd. Um, so, look, I think it's a great start for that for that coaching group. And knowing just to get a win, um, it builds confidence in it. You know, it's, it's instead of, you know, losing and getting that kind of role and snowball effect of not winning test matches, um, winning that game, which I probably thought Scotland going into that, it was a real 50-50 game. Uh, but you know, it's probably the back end of their season and very similar to what we've talked around in the end of the year. It's, it's tough to be able to, um, to win test matches at this time of the year. But um, great confidence booster for, for Argentina and a great start for uh, Michael Checker and his um, start as, as Argentinian head coach. I, I do think, though, you have to acknowledge some of the coaching, and, and one key step for me is so often that we see with um, Argentina as, you know, sort of reckless offloads, you know, they, they just sort of chance their arm a little bit, but eight turnovers in 80 mm -hmm. minutes, that is, that is a low number of turnovers. Um, so every offload, every pass they gave, every collision, they were, you know, meticulous in, in what they were trying to achieve and, and probably knew from the coaches if they don't get it right and they do make a lot of errors, you'd probably just get shepherds hooked. Um, so there, there definitely was a change in mindset in, in terms of that, you know, taking away that reckless nature and, and I suppose not respecting the ball. Um, and five line breaks, you know, they, I, I just really enjoyed their attack. I think, you know, it's sort of they had that flair mm. balance with a little bit of discipline as well. Mm, mm. You mentioned a little bit earlier the comparison to Tonga uh, with, you know, Malika Fekitoa, Charles Pietau, um, Israel Folau coming into that team and I suppose the idea that they haven't spent much time together. In fact, I'm sure for a lot of the players it might have been one of the first times. And all new really. systems yeah. too. Like yeah. with new coaches come new systems and new ways of doing things. So it's a lot of change. Yeah. So what should the expectations be? I mean, because there's a lot of chat about this Tongan team. They've picked up some of the biggest superstars in world rugby and there's probably a lot of expectation around it. Yeah, there is, but I think, um, you know, they are all massive attacking threats out wide, but, the, you know, we've spoken about the importance of a platform up front. So it's just getting that, um, you know, they've had a, a number of um, guys come back to play in the forwards as well, so just getting that balance right and making sure that the ball is put on a platter. Um, I don't know if anyone would have done too well against Fiji, the way the, the mode they were in and the way they were playing and the way they were getting across the game line, the pace they were playing at and, and the heat, as you mentioned. So, um, and, and we said it, I don't know, a number of weeks ago when they named that squad, is, it's not going to be that easy just to flick a switch and turn everything around. It will take time. And we've jumped on the Ben Darwin theory of cohesion more than anyone else. And I think that is a big factor here. Yeah, it's massive. Um, I suppose one of the things that Fiji's done really well is create a team like the Drua, you know, yes. and, and I know that's easier said than done, but you could see it. They started the front row, yeah. you know, and those kind of things make life much easier, Brennan, in a one-off situation. 
Oh, well, that's it. It's it's cohesion. It's being able to understand the guy that's next to you and being able to play, and I guess at a high intensity, you know, playing against the Australians and the New Zealand teams on a week-in-week -week basis, is, it's going to make your game a lot better. And you, know, you look at um, Samoa, a lot of those boys played for the Moana Pacifica as well, you know, being able to play in that and being able to get a great result against the Australian A and being able to get that win. Um, you know, they probably don't get that, I think, if a lot of those boys weren't playing in that um, Moana Pacifica um, team um, at the start of the year. So um, it just shows... You know, given opportunities um, at you know domestic level in Super Rugby Pacific, and getting to be able to play week in and week out against that kind of um, opposition, it makes you better as a team. And so, um, I guess for the Tongans, um, I hate to say it, oh, no, I don't say it like this actually. You know, it's the cohesion that they've got to try to build for Rugby World Cup. That should be the goal for them. Mm. You know, it's been able to come 2023. That's the goal of being able to play our best footy right then and there. So they've got a little bit of time now that they've got the Pacific Nations to be able to. Um, play together as a team, understand what structures we want to do, knowing that the bigger picture is to come 2023 and being able to, I guess, ask questions and really be a formidable force um, come that time of the, of the year. Yeah, they've got a few tests to do it. You've got two PNCs to get through before then, and you'll have warm-up test matches for the World Cup. Plus, I think that there are some rules in around World Rugby where the players have got to be released for camps in July-ish next year. So they've got to make sure that there are players available for a longer period of time. So there yeah. is some structure in place to allow for that to happen. And, and I think it will be key, as Bryn says, and understanding there'll be new systems. There may be things some of these players are, can bring to the table as well. You know, like sometimes the most experienced players just act as another coach and um, having the, that ability to mould that into the style of play because you want players to be comfortable with, with the game plan and how they want to play the game. So there may be some you know some teething issues and in, in a, in a feeling out period of those ideas mm -hmm. coming from Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere and just bringing it all together. But mm. I, th I think they've got enough time to do so. Yeah, so if you look at what they're going to do against the Samoa side, you said were you know, very impressive as Australia, eh? What is the next step for them? Is this a win this weekend is right for them? Or do you think that's going to be a little bit beyond their reach? No, I don't think it's getting too fixated on the outcome. I think it's about being able to have um, a blueprint of, you know, at least a couple of times their attacking systems working and showing, um, you know, it's putting defence in a position where they have to make decisions and, and they're choosing the right option more times than not. And then I, I think defensive system is probably the most important um, in terms of a new group. Well, like the old adage of defence wins championships is just so true. If if you can stop points, um, you know better than you can score them. It, you're probably in a better position than the other way around. So, um, you know, 36 points. They they came well. Uh, they came better towards that last 20 minutes. But that first half, it was yeah, she was she was pretty um, easy going for the Fijians to get over the game line. So just shoring up that defence and then maybe having moments of brilliance on attack. Doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be a win, but there needs to be some growth with a second week together. Just before we get into our team of the week and our predictions for the coming weekend, Japan versus France. Japan were in that game, Bryn, for a long period of time. Um, they'll be pretty disappointed to fall away from 13 all at half time to 42 23. Yeah, they would. And I think, you know, for the French team, you know, that game was, like you said, it was 23 16 in the 57th minute. And then I actually thought, you know, Fafana was was outstanding for the French, and you know, probably two individual efforts around him really kind of uh, put it away from there. But um, I guess the great thing for Japan is, you know, for, for 57 minutes of that game, you know, they were winning collisions, they were being able to ask questions, um, you know, put the French under a lot of pressure. But I guess for you know, when it doesn't matter if you're playing an A French team or a B French team, um, it's been able to stay there for the for the whole 80 minutes, and so. Even last year as well, uh, there were a couple of opportunities where they started games really well and it got to that kind of last 20 minutes or last 15 or the last latter stages of the game and they weren't be able to get the results through points or um, just not being able to deal with the pressure that was coming at them. So um, I guess a good start for them and I guess that's kind of an area where I think they need to improve. Um, it's those last 20 minutes of games and I guess the, la the later stages of games have been able to uh, try and win test matches um, in those kind of um, later stages of games. Teams of the week. I'm sure it's going to be a mixed yeah. bag because there was a lot of footy on. <laughs> it's going to be tough going. Yeah. Um, I actually struggled. Honestly, there were so many players that played well and, and getting them into 15, but also acknowledging each game and, and where it ranked in terms of, um, I suppose, pressure and all sorts. So it was hard. It was hard. And it's by no means a perfect 15, but I got there eventually. 
Um, so I had Bauer, George Bauer at one. I had um, Sheehan, the hooker from Ireland. I thought he was awesome. Probably the one reason I, I loved him so much is when Sevi Reese got the intercept, he was chasing back and it was making gains on him. So always good to see a hooker pin his ears back. But he was busy, he was into everything. Um, I've got Michael Al Alato, the, the tight head for Samoa. Um, Petty, uh, the lock from Argentina. Uh, Ratuva, uh, one of the big locks from Fiji. Scott Barrett at six. Fraser McWright um, from Aussie A. He, I thought he was awesome. Um, I know he's, it's not the Aussie top side, but he still performed really well. So I, I, I got him in there at seven. Could have been Hoops, to be honest. Like Michael Hooper had a, had a good game as well, but went with him. Adi Savia, player of the round um, at eight. Um, Bertrano, uh, the nine um, from Ar Argentina. Bodie Barrett at 10. Couldn't split the two wingers. Um, so I went with Hambosi and Awong. You know, Awong's match winning intercept and Hambosi just, he's a, he's a highlight reel. Uh, Delandi at 12. Naya Thilevu, uh, the centre from uh, Fiji, he was, mm. he was unreal. Reece Samet at 14 and Willemsa at 15. That's a good mixture. <laughs> yeah, I don't know um, how they'll all go together, but um, as yeah. individuals they stood out. <laughs> as coached by James <laughs> Oh, they probably all quit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice. Um, got, actually got, got, got quite a few similar guys with Jip as well. Um, I've gone Bauer. I went the, the Fijian hooker. He was awesome. I thought he was, um, he was the outstanding Jip. Um, a little pocket rocket man, or not little, sorry, but a pocket rocket. Um, and his, um, how he played. I actually went offer as well because I think I talked around the whole week. We talked, pumped up the Irish so much and so you know i thought those two boys really put it to Huge. them and uh, put them under a lot of pressure so i went off for i went for offer um i've gone petty and i've actually gone sammy whitelock um who i thought was you know he's just probably continued on his form from the finals footies um with his ability of how he's playing at the moment so i've gone um him i actually went i wanted to go scooter but i've actually gone cam sewer four um for his performance against the irish and and then midweek midweek game for the for the moldies i went mcwright as well i um, thought he was great for he's awesome um man. Mate, how fast is he, man? Oh, man. Jeez, when he scored his second goal. That was ridiculous. Like, yeah, he's like a winner. <laughs> so, um, he's one guy to watch, you know, if Hooper gets injured. I, I um, think he, can't I, be he was a surprise omission from the Aussie team. So, mm. a, a yeah. big performance. He, he's certainly letting people know. Yeah, so, yeah, he's definitely one to watch if um, yeah, there's injuries in the, in the Australian squad. I've gone Artie at eight. Or Aaron Smith. Um, could have gone for the Argentinian guy as well, Jip, but I thought Aaron, considering what we needed from him and the guy, I guess the test match of what it was, how, yeah. how you know, really um the kind of intensity that it was uh, i've got Bodie at 10 um very similar with your wingers i found it really hard this week there were so many good performances ah wong you could have gone with him with his match winning performance um the fijian wingers geez you just pick any of those boys with how Colin they played Betty was the good as well mm. like oh, defensively yeah. his effort yeah. yeah yep but i've gone zamet um i just had to put him on there with his um with the welsh and then i've gone severe reese at 14 um, so those are the two wingers. Could have chosen anybody. I've gone to Pai. I've gone for Fana uh, for the French. Thought he was actually influence, influential in winning that game and being able to win it um, for that French side. And I've actually gone Zan Sullivan uh, with his performance on the weekend. I uh, thought he was great. Could have added a lot, lot of players actually at fullback. I actually thought the, um, who was it? Uh, what was his name? The Argentinian fullback actually went quite well as well. So, But I've gone Sullivan uh, to round off my uh, form 15. You know what I love about Sullivan? It's like he kicks a three iron. You know, like he, he, the trajectory is kind of low, you know, and he just, it, it just looks different when he kicks it. Yeah, it's like his favourite club too. He loves to kick it. He loves yeah. it. That, that 50 22 was outstanding. Yeah. Um, he, he doesn't mind showing how big that left boot is. Yeah. Hell yeah. of a weapon. It was. It made a big difference in that game. Um, so, predictions. We've got a lot of footy again this weekend. Not much time if you're going to go play golf in Queenstown to really play any golf. Probably just uh, have to watch some footy for the weekend. Um, All Blacks versus Ireland in Dunedin. What are you thinking? All Blacks. I, I think it might be a bit tighter, 12 or under. Yeah, yeah I'm going to go All Blacks. I reckon it'll be maybe three points. I think it's going to be pretty close this week. I reckon the uh, Irish will come to, come to town pretty hard. That's good. This series has got people fizzed up. People are mm. turning up. They're watching it on the tally. This is a hell of a series. Hopefully it carries on with a close game like that. Wallabies versus England in Brisbane, Bryn. Um, I'm going to go Wallabies again. I'm going to go Wallabies, but you know, I would just would not be surprised if the um, English get up just through their performance on the weekend. They've shown enough to probably, hopefully, to win that. So, But I'll go with the Australians. 
Wallabies in Brisbane are tough to. It's probably their most successful ground. Mm. Um, they're, they're, like the All Blacks really struggle in Brisbane. Not saying the All Blacks better in England, but just to give reference. Um, so I, I think the Wallabies will get up again. Springboks v Wales and Bloemfontein, the bite back. Yeah, I just think the Springboks won't won't suffer twice. They'll they'll be on the job and they'll go to what they know. They'll go to their box kits. They'll go to their malls. Um, and resettle themselves in, into their, their, their style of play. Yeah, copy and paste. Copy Very and similar paste. to Joe. Excellent. Uh, Los Pumas versus Scotland and Salta, Bryn? Look at the Argies again. Uh, yeah, the Argentinians, I think. Um, you know, the ability to have another test match as well and getting that confidence, um, especially being at home as well, I think. Um, yeah, it'll be another tight game. But, you know, would not be surprised if Scotland uh, were able to come back and win that one, but I'll go the Argentinians just without our... Um, how they got that result on the weekend. Certainly enough to like about Scotland. Like, um, there, there was enough on attack to know that they can produce points. Um, I just think the atmosphere and the way the Argentinians are built, like that passion, the pride in front of their people, that they, they're a hard team to beat over there. So mm. I, I think they'll back it up with another one. Nice. Is it Japan versus France, any difference there? France. 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 Nothing changes. Here's the interesting ones. I suppose Samoa versus Tonga. We touched on it before, Bryn. Um, I'll go Samoa, but I think it's going to be a better performance um, from the Tongan boys. I think um, defensively, they, hopefully they make a few adjustments and actually a lot better in the contact and physicality because the Fijians really uh, dominated in the collision era. So I just I can imagine it'll be a bit better, but the Samoans, I think, will, um, will win that one. Yeah, look, I think a Chris Vui led line out in scrum, um, he's going to give pretty good ball for those backs to play off. That'll be Tonga's big area of work on a set piece and making sure that they can get parity. If they can get parity, they bring themselves into the race. But if, if they lose a bit of ball and, and not as strong up front, um, we, we won't see the likes of Fekitao or Falao or, or Piatel. Yeah, yeah. The other game in Latoka is Fiji versus Australia A. Do Australia A stand a chance against that Fiji inside? It's hard to punt against the Fijians, to be honest. Like, th there were parts of that Aussie A game you know they'll get better, that they will be better this week. But I don't know, the Fijians for me will win that, especially La Tolka. It'll, it'll be a doozy, that's for sure. Yeah, I think the Australians are going to get better. They'll get better. But, um, man, how can you not back the Fijians after their performance on the weekend? So uh, maybe if it's a monsoon. Uh, I just don't know how... But... It's, it's they're such big bodies, their forwards and their midfielders. Like somehow you've got to stem the flow of that momentum. Mm. You know, so if the Wallaby A's can can do that, they know that they've got the skill set to score points and and get themselves in the game. But if you can't stem that physical momentum of just getting dominated in those collisions and then their ability to offload once they win that collision, she's a big ask. <laughs> she's a and at home. Yeah, it's it's a huge ask. Yeah, it's yeah. An, honest. It's a nightmare playing up there, man, oh. against the Fijian boys. Man, it's just they grow another arm or leg, and um, the conditions, the atmosphere, the way they play, um, it's so tough. And so, yeah, if the Australian A's can do it. Man, fair play to the, the Fijians. That's a big result play, so. if Aussie A win it. Mm. I mean, that's a great. Yeah. That would be a great result and a sign for Aussie rugby and, and Dave Rennie and the depth he's got to work towards to 2023 because they they're just getting. More and more hard nose those Wallabies, and, and they know th uh, their way to edge out wins like they showed with a red card or not in Perth. So um, that'll be a huge result. I I'm picking Fiji, but that would be a massive result for Aussie. Uh, New Zealand rugby fans probably should be a little jealous of that Aussie A team playing in that competition because it's a tough competition and it's giving that next level of depth some real good showing. Like. Yeah, and, and that's why I'm really excited to see that All Blacks 15 tour announcement. It looked, mm. you know, an awesome. Um, Tour there's there's some you know world class opposition that they're going to come up against so um, exciting for that group and, and and I think a lot of um, you know the beauty of having the Maori All Blacks playing at the moment a lot of them have put their hand up for that All Blacks 15 as well and and wanting to progress their careers towards a, a you know representing the All Blacks as well absolutely well six games at least to watch seven games to watch that's 14 hours of rugby this weekend <laughs> so you know. Yeah. <laughs> set the mice guy. guy. Set the mice guy. There is plenty to watch. Bryn, thank you very much once again. Enjoy the weekend. Look after yourself.
Brenna, thank you. Yeah. You're Jipper. That's Brenna. <laughs> it's been a long show. It's been a long it's show. It's been a long show. We've been show. going for a while now. Yeah. <laughs> um, lots of rugby, all of it, of course, on Sky Sport. Tune in this weekend to see it all. And, of course, catch all of the reaction on rugbypass.com.